Hello, everyone, and welcome to ACP's Live Remote Non-CE Offering. I am Jody Brzezinski, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. ACP's Live Remote Webinar Series includes both CE and non-CE offerings and has been launched to provide additional remote resources and outreach to our facility partners. Today's non-CE topic is a Tip Tuesdays presentation titled Practical Innovations for In-Room Treatments. During the webinar, you will have the opportunity to ask questions using the Q&A feature. As time permits, we will answer questions at the end of the presentation. Keep in mind that you may always contact your clinical program consultant directly or contact ACP Remote Clinical Support at 800-250-1100, extension 2, or by email at acp-clinicalquestions at hangar.com. Handouts for today's webinar will be emailed to all participants. Immediately after the webinar ends, you will receive a survey in your browser. We welcome your feedback regarding today's webinar and suggestions for what you would like to see included on the ACP Live Remote Calendar in coming months. Please take a moment to complete the survey to help us improve these remote clinical offerings. I would like to now introduce our presenters for today. Both presenters are clinical program consultants and physical therapists with ACP, Jeremy Dunlap and Kara Whittemore. Jeremy? Yep, can you hear me okay, Jody? Perfect, all right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, Jody, thank you for moderating. Uh, Kara, thank you for all your hard work with this topic. Uh, and thank you for the participants. We have a great turnout for this non-CEU topic, so thank you very much for joining us. Uh, so we're gonna dive right in. Um, it's, we're still seeing in an overwhelming majority of our buildings uh, treatment being done bedside, and it's, it's specific to our, our acute care settings or subacute care settings and our long-term care facilities. Uh, with this, it does present a unique set of challenges. Uh, it also presents a unique set of opportunities. Um, and so we're gonna highlight some of those today. So the goals for today's uh, brief non-CEU topic include a recognition that despite challenges associated with social distancing and quarantine protocols, skill therapy does remain an essential need for our patient population. Uh, we hope to be able to provide clinicians with strategies for properly dosing resistance training, electric stimulation, and aerobic exercise to help increase strength and mobility, while also promoting cognitive function and emotional well-being using a creative approach. We are also going to encourage clinicians to use pre-planning Okay, uh, hopefully you can all hear me okay. Uh, it looks like we just got disconnected with our phone line. So we're gonna switch to computer audio. Um, please let Jody know if you are not able to hear me effectively uh, and we will uh, keep moving forward from there. Our last goal is to encourage clinicians to use pre-planning variety and creativity to improve range of motion, speed, intensity, uh, directional movements, as well as transitional movements. And Jody, please feel free to chime in and stop me if participants are not able to hear me. So far, I can hear you and I haven't gotten any other feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, so some of the benefits of in-room therapy treatments, and some of this is a little bit self-explanatory, uh, it's going to most likely, and we've experienced this in the gyms we've been in, or the, excuse me, the buildings we've been in uh, with gyms that are closed, uh, is it does decrease the likelihood of poor therapy attendance, uh, those sometimes built-in excuses of not having transportation down to the therapy gym, or some of those softer refusals um, uh, for participation in therapy tend to go away when we are delivering therapy directly to the patient's room. Uh, I, in some instances, it does provide for improved privacy and an enhanced feeling of one-on-one -on -one service. And this can be uh, beneficial for certain patient populations. Uh, it does allow us to uh, practice environment specific activities of daily living and functional mobility. Obviously we have access to beds and mirror, mirrors and commodes and footboards and the patient's own footwear. Uh, we can work on navigating uh, the, the bathroom, which direction does the door swing, where are the grab bars located. 
Uh, from a bed mobility standpoint, it gets us a, a chance to work on a softer non-compliant surface instead of our traditional high-low mat tables. Uh, and again, commode transfers, negotiation around the bed, um, negotiation around obstacles, dealing with cell phone wires and uh, laptops and tray tables and all that. Uh, if we are working in the patient's individual home environment or their own, own apartment, it does give us a unique opportunity to assess the safety and efficacy of the environment and make uh, modifications and recommendations uh, based on that. Uh, generally speaking, the patient's room is will be less noisy and less distractive versus a traditional therapy gym. Uh, I, I think Kara said it best when she said it helped to set the mood uh, and influence the space to maximize success. Uh, and as we're going through therapy regimens, whether it's aerobic training, resistance exercise, balance work, gait training, uh, maybe even caregiver education, a lot of those aspects, when they are conducted within the confines of the patient's room, uh, they may be more easily transferable to a successful home exercise program. Some of the limitations of in-room therapy treatments, and I'll bet many of the participants have experienced this uh, uh, on an individual level. Uh, it oftentimes, we do have less space to work with. The physical plan overall is decreased. So it does offer some challenges with uh, some balance drills, specific objective measure testing, uh, certain forms of aerobic training. You know, for example, if my goal was to do a two or six minute walk test with a patient, that's really not gonna be possible in, the, in a standard sized patient room. Uh, other objective measure testing, such as timed up and go, DGI, gait velocity test, uh, we may have to be a little more creative with how we implement them or choose other tests. Um, focusing on balance training, uneven terrain, non-compliant surfaces, stair training, curbs, uh, that does present some unique challenges when we're doing therapy inside the patient's room. Uh, also, we may have decreased access to certain diagnostic tools and capital equipment. Uh, it's not realistic for us to drag a treadmill down to the patient's room or something like a new step. Uh, that being said, all of ACP equipment, if you are, if you are a partner with ACP, uh, I cannot think of one piece of equipment that we have or we offer that is not on a set of wheels. Uh, a huge number of our partners have uh, wheeled the OmniCycle down to the patient's room very easily transportable. Uh, so yes, it's a limitation that we may not have access to a uh, body light system or a treadmill, but we do have a lot of opportunity with respirators, upper and lower body ergometers, things like the OmniCycle. Uh, other diagnostic tools, such as your synchrony dysphagia system, uh, obviously your biophysical agents, your ESIM ultrasound and diathermy are obviously uh, very um, transportable down to the patient's room. Uh, one of our colleagues with ACP recently gave a seminar on a virtual day out where they park the Omni VR uh, in the doorway of a patient's room and we try to mimic an outdoor environment and give the patient some level of, um, uh, you know, even though it's, 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 it's a virtual environment, but we're trying to replicate an outdoor environment and, and decrease the monotony of being stuck in your room all the time. So Kara's going to spend a little more time talking about a creative approach, but don't let being stuck inside the patient's room be an easy excuse for a low quality of therapy being delivered. An uh, important aspect when we were putting this uh, course together was, you know, how, how do you have success inside the patient's room? I think a huge component to it is having a plan in place before you ever enter the patient's room. Uh, it's going to make sure the time you're spending with the patient is both efficient as well as effective. Gather the tools you, and equipment you need before you enter the patient's room, whether it's your diagnostic scales, your modified RPE scales, your Wong Baker scales, your pain scales, uh, dyspnea scales, uh, exercise flow charts and things of that nature. Have your portable exercise equipment available and ready to go. Have it disinfected from the last patient, whether it's your dumbbells, cuff weights, uh, you know, in a lot of cases we're using body weight resistance. Have your vital sign assessment tools. Uh, available uh, before the start of the treatment, you know, your pulse oximeters, uh, synchrony dysphagia uh, devices, blood pressure cuffs, et cetera. Uh, and obviously, if, uh, if we are addressing impairments um, specific to biophysical agents, we want to have those tools ready and available and charged or have access to an outlet or something like that uh, prior to starting the treatment. 
associated with those devices, you do want to have the proper infection control supplies uh, with you so you're not in and out of the patient's room multiple times, having to don and doff your PPE multiple times. Uh, so that includes your hospital grade disinfectant wipes to clean the equipment potentially before and definitely after uh, your intervention. Uh, and from an ACP equipment standpoint, we do offer uh, things like barrier film and polytubing that is specific to your ACP equipment. If you do not have uh, disinfectant equipment associated with your ACP devices. If you are a partner with ACP, please do reach out to your clinical program consultant so we can help arrange uh, to get you that uh, infection control um, equipment. Uh, since we are in a time and therapy practice where we are doing a ton of point of service documentation, if allowable by your employer, have your laptop or tablet or paper chart available. So as the patient is taking breaks, you're able to update your documentation. It's also a really good opportunity to review your short and long-term goals to make sure that we're driving therapy that supports execution of the goals. Um, Last note about technology, a lot of the tablets and laptops, uh, we do have the ability to download specific applications, whether it's target heart rate apps, um, exercise prescription models, uh, there's even a pulse oximeter that's available through the iPhone now. Uh, so sometimes those things are a little more portable uh, and a little more timely. Um, in any event, the goal is to have success with assessment and then diving in with a treatment approach for your patient. Uh, to button up this point, just a reminder, disinfect all equipment as per employer policy prior to leaving the patient's room. Also, uh, as part of having a plan in place, thorough chart review. Uh, I, I'm consistently surprised, that, and, and I'm guilty of this myself, that we forget to take a look at the chart, especially if it's a patient that's been on caseload for a little while uh, for specific updates uh, and the direction of the plan of care. That's a good reminder to review your short and long-term goals, as mentioned, specifically looking at flow charts previous treatment models, interventions that other therapists may have done earlier in the week. Uh, I like to ask myself, uh, quote, what do I want to accomplish with my patient in a given session? Uh, I know that sounds overly simple, but when you're really stressed out and, and you're, yeah, yeah, put on your glove and gowns and face shield and mask, uh, and the patient is saying they don't want to do therapy, sometimes it's hard to see the forest from the trees as far as what is it that I want to accomplish today? Overwhelmingly, uh, in therapy, from a billing standpoint and a documentation standpoint, we tend to use the functional limitation model, uh, which, which is normal, but sometimes that doesn't answer the question of what it is I want to accomplish in a given session. So reverting back to more of an impairment model where, I don't know, uh, Mr. Smith is having a hard time with his sit-to-stand transfers. Uh, so we could work on 20 million sit-to-stand transfers, which may be very appropriate for that patient in a given session, uh, but maybe all I'm doing is grabbing the patient by the back of their pants and practicing a rote task over and over again. And, and I'll show you a slide uh, in an upcoming slide on this. Um, but if I take a step back and talk more about the impairment model as to why is Mr. Smith having a hard time with his sit-to-stand transfers? Is it knee pain? Uh, is it a cognitive impairment? Is it decreased balance? Is it anxiety? Is it low vision? Once I start to outline and understand the underlying physiologic impairments, it's a little bit easier to triage and address it from a functional limitation model. Uh, we put up here a couple examples of some ACP clinical pathway documents. This is a PT and OT clinical pathway specific to ACP's fall prevention programming. Uh, these are not meant to be a cookbook. Uh, for the sake of this topic, they're more of a general example of how we might decide to approach a week or two of therapeutic interventions when we are confined to a patient's room. Uh, we can take a look at specific outcome measurements for fall prevention, whether it's tug, uh, gait velocity tests, um, yeah, two minute walk tests or something of that nature. And then from there, we can start to look at aerobic training, resistance training, uh, maybe electrotherapy uh, to help improve an ankle strategy or balance. Uh, and again, this is not meant to be a, a cookbook sort of approach, more of a, a clinical framework to help discuss how we're going to approach a series of treatments for po uh, both PT and OT interventions.
Lastly, with having a plan in place is a, a subtle reminder of communication. Uh, be very liberal with your communication, both within the confines of rehab between PT, OT, and SLP, and may offer some unique opportunities uh, for co-treating, or, or if not co-treating, maybe determining a work rest cycle. Um, also include activities and restorative nursing departments, because uh, number one, that will help prepare us uh, for a successful discharge with these patient populations, uh, but also, you know, what types of activities are they already participating in? Do they need a breathing treatment before we dive in with aerobic training? Did the patient already have a lot of activity uh, with the activities department earlier in the day? So having that knowledge prior to even starting your treatment will give us a leg up with having success. Um, touch base with nursing before you go into the patient's room. I know it's standard practice, but this does allow us real-time updates for changes in medical status. And obviously we are dealing with very medically complex patient populations at the present time. I can help us coordinate schedules uh, with medications, dressing changes, uh, and things of that nature. Uh, with respect to coordination of communication with CNAs, uh, maybe they took the vital signs one minute ago. So maybe you can use their vital signs uh, and save yourselves a few minutes of documentation. Uh, maybe it's a situation where uh, the CNAs are able to have the patient dressed in the proper footwear and ready to go. Uh, that will help me complete what I need to as a PT in a more timely fashion. Uh, from an OT standpoint, if the goal is to focus on ADLs, we need to make sure those aren't done ahead of the treatment uh, so that we can get in there and work on that with the patient. Uh, speaking of OTs, I do think, and I am not one of those guys, and I know, I know I just did it, but I'm not one of those guys that likes to uh, differentiate between OTs and PTs. You know, PTs have to work from the waist down and OTs have to work from the waist up. That's uh, completely silly. Uh, however, I do think OT does tend to spend more time doing bedside treatments than PT does. Uh, they do a lot of room modification, environmental modifications. Uh, they have a high level of expertise in those close quarters. Uh, so lean on them um, and use their expertise to our advantage. Uh, effective communication between rehab disciplines, nursing, and administration does ensure that members of your team actually know where you are, uh, allows for increased confidence and support when treating medically complex patient populations, and does help to minimize the inefficiencies with donning and doffing of PPE, um, going out to grab medical devices, um, and overall helps with patient preparedness. Okay, so I want to talk about measuring treatment outcomes. So with treatment outcomes, we know that, I'm gonna just um, move on to the next slide, thank you. <laughs> with treatment outcomes, we're using them to assess um, quantifying our clinical observations, to assess the function, but also to really help guide treatment and whether our interventions are effective or not. And it does present a challenge in working when we're more in the room environment now with the COVID pandemic. Um, when we want to do a standardized test, we want to administer it the way it was authored or engineered. Um, and we may be able to do that with some of our outcome measures in the rooms, but others we're not gonna be able to do quite as they were authored. So we may need to modify when we do that, we need to make sure that we document because, and we also cannot compare that information to normative standards if we're changing something. But um, we, we want to keep in mind to use the ones that are recommended and that are discipline appropriate. In the next slide, we're going to talk about the um, ones. This is just a list. It's not all inclusive, but it's some ideas of ones that can be completed within the room environment. For example, we have some of the endurance tests. We can't do maybe the two minute or six minute walk, but we could certainly do seated step test. Um, when we're looking at balance and strengthening, there's a lot of tests like the Berg, the modified cat sieve, functional reach, or the modified functional reach. We can do sitting mobility, look at let it, Looking at function and sitting. We can do subjective tests such as the activity specific balance confidence scale, chair rise tests, um, the Tenetti possibly, it depends on your room, four score, four square step tests. Um, the time up and go, as Jeremy had mentioned, we may or may not have the room for in a room. If I have a patient and they're not using an assistive device, I may have enough room for them to walk 10 feet, turn around and come back. But if they have a walker, 
we may find that even though we have 10 feet, when they start to try to go around the turn with the walker, they're starting to slow down because there's the bed that's near them or there's the, they're getting close to the wall. So if they start to change the performance, obviously we're not gonna get an accurate measure. So we need to be sure that we're really assessing how well that test is able to be um, utilized within that room environment. We can do cognitive tests, the Bartel components, maybe not the full Bartel, um, looking at some different strength and uh, manual function tests, as well as the pain scales that Jeremy discussed earlier. We're going to spend a couple of minutes talking about strength training protocols. Uh, this obviously, and then Kara's going to spend a couple of minutes talking about aerobic exercise and, and a creative approach. Uh, it's not meant to be all exhaustive. Uh, in, in the short time that we have, ACP does offer separate coursework related to PREs, aerobic exercise, and electrotherapy. And we encourage you to reach out to your ACP consultant uh, to take part in these as part of a private uh, or a public um, a CEU opportunity. Uh, so, I already hit on the idea of linking functional limitations to primary physiologic impairments. If we're talking about progressive resistance exercise, the primary physiologic impairment we're discussing is obviously disuse atrophy or weakness. Uh, as a new grad close to 20 years ago, 18, 19 years ago, uh, I was not a big a proponent of supine mat programs. Uh, I was all about getting my patient vertical and being very manual. Uh, and, and as a younger therapist, I was really missing a lot of opportunity. Uh, and think about it, fast forward 10 years uh, to the early 2000s where we're talking about um, you know, P90X and beach body and all that, we're all home doing body weight resistance supine mat programs in a sense. So when they're done in a skilled and mindful way, uh, they can be really appropriate for our patients. Uh, obviously, we need to consider the term progress and the term progressive resistance exercise. So we do need to bump up the re repetitions and resistance as the patient is able to tolerate. Uh, but it does offer us a lot of opportunities to have significant strength gains and sort of cut into those functional limitations uh, with our older adult patient populations. Uh, in addition, neuromuscular electric stimulation uh, to, to key targeted muscle groups prior to or during volitional exercise uh, may help improve exercise performance, uh, may help normalize movement patterns, and obviously will help improve your functional outcomes. Uh, on the bottom of this slide is an excerpt from ACP's fall prevention text, which specifically takes a look at the clinical presentation of certain forms of gross motor ADLs. Uh, and with that, the potential muscle weakness involved, as well as the limited range of motion that may be involved. So for example, if someone is having difficulty with their sit to stand transfers, you know, maybe the clinical presentation is that the patient can't stand up fully straight. Uh, the muscles involved may include concentric hip extensors, uh, glute max and hamstring weakness, and the limited range of motion is most often hip extension. So, and I think therapists do a really good job of of, uh, of going through this uh, exercise in their own heads, uh, but it's nice to have it laid out in a grid format. When we're intervening with optimal PRE protocols, the example on this slide is for a moderate level of resistance. This comes directly from the American College of Sports Medicine. So the gold standard would be doing a one rep max with our patient. Uh, that's going to be virtually impossible doing a bedside treatment. It's also not clinically appropriate for a majority of our older adult patient populations. So we really need another method. And what's come up with uh, from the um, APTA, CEEAA, as well as through the American College of Sports Medicine, is using a modified RPE scale to determine a certain level of intensity. So generally speaking, uh, with a moderate level of intensity, uh, we're going to choose a level of resistance, whether it's a cuff weight, uh, a dumbbell, or again, body weight resistance, where we think the patient will be able to perform somewhere between 12 and 20 repetitions. And a lot of times, uh, this is a guessing game. Uh, what the American College of Sports Medicine recommends is number one, don't tell your patient how many repetitions to do. We count for them or along with them while they're breathing, um, and we stop the exercise when the patient is no longer able to go through it successfully, and we'll go through that in the next slide. But generally speaking, we're going to do one or two repetitions of a given exercise. We're going to stop, 
and ask the patient how challenging it was. Ideally, we hold up a version of the modified RPE scale shown below. And if our goal is a moderate level of intensity, they will generally be somewhere between a two and a four with their perception of intensity. Uh, if they say it's extremely easy, uh, don't bother going through the exercise, bump up the resistance. If they say it's extremely, extremely challenging, maybe we bump down the resistance. So as they're going through the exercise, oftentimes we'll notice a slight increase in respiration, uh, maybe a slight tremor. Uh, and again, we will increase or decrease the resistance uh, based on the above. So, so going to the second bullet, uh, there's a lot of evidence that supports a high intensity level of PRE uh, for a majority of our patient populations, uh, which would be somewhere between eight and 12 repetitions. For the sake of today's course, we decided to go with a moderate level of intensity, again, somewhere between 12 and 20 repetitions. So as the patient shows progress over time, they, uh, with the same level of resistance, they will eventually exceed 20 repetitions. When that happens, we're going to bump up the resistance. And as we bump up the resistance, maybe we go from the red TheraBand to the green or the blue TheraBand. As we bump up the resistance, we would naturally expect the repetitions to go back down. Again, we're refraining from telling the patient how many repetitions to perform overall. And as we count along with the patient, we discontinue the exercise when the patient is no longer available, excuse me, when the patient is no longer able to go through the full available range of motion. Um, uh, if, if the patient is not able to uh, uh, complete the repetition slowly, or if the patient starts to substitute. And oftentimes via exercise performance, uh, the patients will tend to communicate non-verbally when it's time to increase the repetitions. Uh, moving on real quickly to e-STEM, and again, this is a non-exhaustive discussion of e-STEM. We're just going to give you a couple examples. Uh, there's times we're sitting in the, in the big gym and we forget about the value of e-STEM. When we're down in the patient's room, it's a really good opportunity to go back to that impairment model and saying, why is my patient in need of therapy? Is it pain? Is it weakness? Is it hypertonicity? Does the patient have a wound? Uh, does the patient have edema? And then we can go over, if, you have, if you're an ACP partner, you can go directly over to your Omniversa device and choose a protocol that's going to be appropriate to address that physiologic impairment. So a couple quick examples, uh, we chose to use uh, ACP's lower extremity triphasic patterned electrical nerve stimulation. Maybe I determined that my patient has a Trendelenburg um, uh, has some, some balance issues or some proximal weakness. So maybe I isolate the iliopsoas, the paraspinals, uh, the abdominals, the rectus, the glutes, the hamstrings. I wake up those nerves and muscles with electrotherapy. And then I follow that up immediately with single limb or double limb bridging, um, you know, maybe clamshell. If I'm in more of a coronal plane uh, and I need to focus on something like glute medius uh, or, or maybe even a quad hamstring glute if it's a, a static or dynamic standing balance or difficulty with sit to stand transfers. So again, the idea is we look at the clinical presentation of the patient and then we dive in with something that's, uh, that's going to be appropriate to address those needs. Uh, the last thing I'll mention with respect to electrotherapy is uh, most of ACP partners will have a portable uh, pen cycle walk unit in the therapy gyms. Uh, this is a small handheld, there's a picture of it, small handheld e device that usually comes in a small black case. Uh, and it is preset with our cycle walk, excuse me, cycle and walk protocols, uh, which is more of a reciprocating style of pattern. Uh, we would use it on alternating quadriceps or something like alternating triceps. Uh, the benefits of the, uh, uh, the portable uh, cycle walk unit is that uh, one, I may be able to kill two birds with one stone and stack a couple treatments together. So uh, in the, the, the second picture listed here where the gentleman's on the omnicycle, maybe I set up electrotherapy on bilateral quadriceps and it's a reciprocating pattern. I know that I'm using the electrotherapy to maximize type two muscle fiber recruitment. And at the exact same moment in time, the patient is also benefiting from a level of aerobic exercise. So again, it's really just a matter of thinking about what you want to do with your patient before you enter the patient's room, and then using specific targeted therapies to address those needs. So in addition to doing progressive resistance, we can also look at aerobic exercise and the benefits. 
So some of the benefits we know is that patients have improved task efficiency so they can complete their ADLs, ADLs easy, more easily. They have energy conservation, a big um, factor with patients that are having less social interactions as they start to be a little depressed, may have some anxiety, they may feel just very fatigued and down all the time. And also we're seeing some increases in falls because of decreased strength. So one of the things about aerobic exercise is there's lots of research showing that it actually increases energy, less fatigue, elevates the mood, and it reduces the risk that we're seeing from some of this more sedentary behavior, such as risk of chronic disease, um, functional limitations, et cetera. So the general guidelines for aerobic exercise for those that are 65 and older or those with chronic conditions that are a little bit younger is they say moderate intensity. Moderate intensity refers to heart rate reserve between 40 to 70% generally or a five to six on the zero to 10 RPE scale, 30 minutes, five days a week. Just remember, again, as in PREs, we need to progress the work workload as the individual improves. And, and when we start to get into longer times, like they're closer to 30 minutes, we need to make sure we're doing long warm-ups, 10 minutes of warm-up and cool down. Because with the geriatric population, their systems are not as flexible. They take a lot longer to adjust to those changes. Um, you can calculate heart rate reserve many different ways. You can manually calculate it. Um, there's a formula there. You can also, ACP has charts in the aerobic exercise course appendix, or you can use an app that all you do is download the app and you put in the patient's age and the resting heart rate, and it'll give you the different target heart rate zones. Remember, clinicians have to determine if exercise, aerobic exercise is safe for each patient in appropriate intensities within that 40 to 70%. And also review your company specific policies and guidelines because many of them have contraindications with absolute and relative and termination criteria listed in their policies. Um, when we look at skilled intervention, we want to be sure that we're monitoring mid-pre, mid-post-treatment. So we can be monitoring several different things, heart rate, blood pressure, O2 sats with the pulse ox, respirations. We can use the Borg scale for subjective response. And we're going to modify the intensity of what we're doing based on that, based on the, that what we're getting from those readings, and that is skilled therapy. You can use a heart monitor or a pulse oximeter, but I would suggest you also manually palpate because the pulse ox is going to give you a number, but you're not going to be telling, you're not going to tell what the rhythm is doing if there's a significant change. So it's a little um, better to also manually palpate. Remember those on cardiac meds will have special considerations that you need to be aware of. And when somebody is not appropriate for aerobic exercise, especially if they're severely compromised cardiopulmonary patients, they may be able to participate with low level resistance and low level resistance in those individuals can provide similar benefits as aerobic exercise with more um, fit individuals. We also have some guidelines for specific populations. And what you'll see is most of them still are close to that 40 to 70%. Some go a little higher. For example, with CAD, it goes to 85. Some a little lower, like with congestive heart failure, they're gonna stay in a range of 40 to 60%. You can do either intervals or continuous exercise. And it kind of lists which ones have been demonstrated in the literature to be effective and then the time for when we want to keep them in that heart rate zone, as well as warm up and cool down periods. This is just showing for, for example, COPD, if I'm doing continuous, I want to keep them more at a moderate level on the RPE scale. If they're doing the actual interval, they can be working a little harder and they'll be at that somewhat hard. And then of course they'll drop down during a rest period. Also same with the dyspnea, we would have them at slight to moderate when they're doing continuous training and a little more towards the severe dyspnea with interval, but not quite up to severe. 
Um, so when we're doing our warm up, the big goal here is to increase circulation. We can do hand opening, close, wrist circles, shoulder circles, any of the range of motion type exercises. We can also do postural exercises, chin tucks, shoulder um, retraction, pelvic tilts. We can do a single extremity exercise um, at a nice easy pace, or we could do gentle cycling at a self-selected speed. Again, this is just some ideas, not an inclusive list. And then we wanna move into target heart rate range. So we wanna keep them in their target range for a specified period. We may have to start with only five or 10 minutes for those more compromised, but ideally working up to more that 30 minutes. So for those seated patients, non-ambulatory, I can start with single upper extremity and start to go a little faster. I can do bilateral, or I could do bilateral extremities with uh, the other extremity. So let's say I raise my arms and I do a kick with my legs or arms out to the side and I do a marching with my hips. We could do seated running in place or jumping jacks. Consider intervals for those who have more difficulty with that continuous exercise. Use the omnicycle. As Jeremy mentioned, these can be transported. I can do intervals on the omnicycle. I can vary the speed. So I'm not just working at the same 15 reps per minute, but I'm really, you know, kind of working more to get into that target heart rate. I can vary the direction going backwards. I can add resistance to that, or I can add the cycle walk portable unit for functional cycling to add that extra sensory input and the type two muscle firing that we would get from that. With the VR, there's many seated activities if they're non-ambulatory. So I could possibly do an upper extremity activity followed by a lower extremity activity, and then maybe a trunk activity, go back to upper extremity. So we can keep cycling through different sections of the body with different seated VR programs. The big things, be creative and relate the activities to their interests or past history. Not everybody likes music. If they don't like music, maybe they would like Kenpo or pick, kickboxing where they're doing different jabs, punches and crosses, different blocks. Or maybe if they like music, you know, think about what type of music do they like? Do they like dance? Do they like playing instruments? Vary the musical theme. We could have big band. They could do like the Charleston where they're doing all the dance moves that go with the Charleston. Um, we could airplay instruments. I could give them sticks and they could play a drum solo on their bed, or they could do um, a jazz with a, a saxophone where they're really incorporating some trunk movement into it. So once we've finished the heart rate zone, then we want to, um, with standing activities, there's some different options as well. So um, you could set up circuit training in the room. I could have a station where I have a chair where they're doing seated activities, sit to stand type activities, and then they can move to another station where they're holding the bed rail and they can do toe raises, squats, kicks, step ups, etc. Or we could do freestanding station if they're able and they have the balance. We can do marching, mountain climbers, sidestepping. The Omni VR presents some opportunities for standing activities as well, such as the stroll and city walk, where we can increase the time of those activities and the speed that they're kind of working on. And the Omni to stand, also the dynamic balance system, if you have that, we can utilize that to do a wide variety of activities in standing that are gonna challenge it aerobically. Big thing, be creative, vary the speed, vary the surface, vary the direction and activities, keep it entertaining and fun for the individual. So the cool down, the goal is to get back to that steady state, to allow their body that time to recover back to those resting vitals. So um, we might do gentle kicks and marching, single upper extremity or lower extremity activities again, maybe some stretching activities and sitting or standing, deep breathing exercises, seated yoga can be a great option. If you're using the OmniCycle back to a self-selected speed, um, a nice gentle um, cycling. With the VR, if we were doing standing activities, maybe we go back down to seated position and do some gentle kicks with the picnic exercise or the puzzle activity. Um, we can also work on pre-gate and gate activities. So with pre-gate, um, 
you know, ideally with ambulation, we would want to do it in a larger area to fully assess all the different mobility on levels, uneven surfaces, stairs, curbs, encompassing the aerobic endurance aspect. But we can really work on specific gate components in the room. And a lot of these we don't probably address as much as we could. So it's a nice opportunity to really work on them. And we'll discuss some of the options with that, as well as in-room environments, maybe more applicable to what their home environment environment really is, Na navigating tight areas and working on more functional um, ambulation with ADLs and IADLs. So um, continuing on, so standing activities with posture up against the wall, we can have them um, stand and really work on a variety of things such as gaze stabilization, focusing their gaze. We can work on alignment, um, utilizing proprioceptive cues from the wall. You know, so as they do a chin tuck, they can feel the pressure change on the wall. They can feel their shoulders retract. They can feel their lumbar curve flatten as they're doing pelvic tilts against the wall. We can also use those pressure preceptive cues for their feet. You know, as they move away from the wall, that, that weight on their balls of their foot changes. As they go back to touching the wall, the weight would be more on the heels. We don't want them falling into the wall, but actually trying to control just to barely touch and do those gentle movements with control, whether we're doing it in in a side to side if we're working on that or if we're doing it in a front to back um, manner position. Focus on breathing activities, berry vision, maybe alter it with gauze over the eyes or dark sunglasses. Static standing activities we can do at the wall or at a bed rail. We can work on varying foot placement from you know wide feet to narrow feet to single leg to maybe having a foot up on a little ball that challenges the balance even more. We can vary upper extremity support with bilateral to one upper extremity to no upper extremity support. And then we can add in an upper extremity manual task while they're maintaining static balance or a cognitive task such as reading a book while they're maintaining their static balance. Again, we can vary vision. We can do standing vestibular activities um, at that, that station and add resistance in a feed forward mode where we're going to say, you know, don't let me move you as we apply the resistance. Very surface type size and narrow this for example, narrow surfaces work more for hip strategy if we're working on a hip strategy. Um, dynamic weight shifting. So if you have somebody and they're not wanting to shift one way, put that side towards the wall. They can work towards the wall. Again, we don't want them just leaning into the wall. We want them to just barely touch the wall and come back, really identify those limits of stability. Same thing if they're working forward to backward in a small range for working on maybe ankle strategy. Um, vary the width of the feet with the different shifts that you're doing and change foot position, do diagonal shifts, add resistance manually or with an elastic band. And as uh, Jeremy, Jeremy mentioned earlier, the functional walk program is really good with shifts. So I can set it instead of RPMs per minute, think about it how many shifts per minute and set it for that to provide that tactile cueing to help with the weight shifting. Um, we can also use it with our gait to work on that with the functional walk. Dynamic stepping, I could place markers on the ground, having them go forwards, backwards, laterally, do a four corner stepping. I can put the markers in sm small distances apart or large distances apart to really work on step lengths, small step lengths, large step lengths. We can vary um, the placement for distancing and we can vary speed. We can step in place and work on head turns for vestibular input, or we could use the step and go up and down or laterally or stepping over the object. The Omni stand and VR also offer opportunities. So the VR on the next page, There we go. So we have a lot of crosswalks for the VR. This one is on therapeutic exercise considerations. We have ones for fall prevention for other programs. But basically, they start with what are some of the more initial activities for, for weakness? These activities might be indicated. Then we can progress to adding in some more balance, some functional sit to stand, gait activities, and finally, dual task activities. So it's a nice reference to look at those. For the um, 
on the stand, this um, quick reference guide has a lot of different balance strategies that you can work on within the Omni stand. So we can work on ankle strategies, we can work on hip and stepping strategies, we can work on anticipatory postural control and reactive postural control, and we can vary the environment with varying vision, varying the um, surface that they're standing on, having them stand on, for example, foam, et cetera, so, or do, do dual task activities. We can also work on gait. So with gait, we can set a distance in the room, maybe 10 feet. I can have them walking forwards and backwards with, I can have them practice stops and turns on command. I can have them walk fast, slow with small steps or with giant steps over that distance. We can have them do walking with head turns, left and right or up and down, or we could work on walking on with the support if we have two lines. Um, and we can vary that width, depending on if we're trying to increase the width or decrease that width that they're using. We can have them walk on their heels and toes on the line to really work on coordination, stepping over and around objects. So be creative. Consider things like the timed up and go with a functional task, maybe carrying water, or with a cognitive task, doing a timed up and go while they're also naming different fruits, for example. The VR gate activities, um, the wolf allows you to work on forwards and backward ambulation. The fox allows you to work on more lateral ambulation. And the flower garden lets you work on multi-directional ambulation. And with all of those, we can increase the speed so that they're having to walk faster, react faster, and also the distance that they're moving, how many feet that they're going. We can also use the stroll and city walk to add in more activities that they have to proactively engage and identify from a safety aspect. So the bottom line um, is just, again, really try to be creative, have that plan that you have, try to do variety to make it fun for the individuals. And I'll turn it back to Jeremy and to Jody, if there's any questions. That's it. And I'm going to turn it over to Jody, see if we have any questions. Thank you, Kara. Um, at this time, I don't see any questions in our Q&A box, so if anyone has a question, please go ahead and type it in right now. You can always, again, ask your CPC for answers to questions that you might have in the future or contact ACP Remote Clinical Support. Uh, I think this was a fantastic um, webinar that gave us tons of information, things to think about with regard to how we can better utilize our time and our space with patients for in-room treatments. Hopefully you found a lot of value to today's webinar. And since I'm not seeing any questions in our Q&A box, I will close the webinar for today. But I wanna thank you all for taking the time to join us. I wanna thank our presenters, Jeremy and Kara, for such a great presentation. And I hope that you all have a fantastic day Please stay healthy and safe out there. And we appreciate all that you're doing every day for your patients and for the teams that you're working with. So we hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.